But on one of those climbing outings, they invited me to come along. And I just had an awakening uh, yeah. the very first time I tried it. Right. So, good afternoon. TK here. This is Career Talks when I interview people across different industries about different uh, career paths. So, this is interview number two. And today's guest is Ron Funderberg, the Director of Education at Colorado Mountain School. So, Ron, great to have you today. Thank you so much Thanks. for joining us. Uh, thanks. It's good to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So um, Colorado Mountain School is Colorado's largest mountain guide company, right? So um, could you tell us more about your current work and role and a little bit more about Colorado Mountain School as well? Oh, sure. Um, so Colorado Mountain School is, the, as you mentioned, is the oldest uh, climbing school here in Colorado. Um, we're an American Mountain Guides Association accredited climbing school, um, really specializing in the front range. Mm -hmm. So everything on uh, this side of the Continental Divide is kind of our specialty, our terrain. Okay. Um, my role is the Director of Education. So I guarantee a robust educational product uh, across okay. all of our products. Um, so that would be if you take a class or if you take our Intro to Rock Climbing class. Yeah. Then my work focuses on making sure that our instructors are really good educators, mm -hmm. that the curriculum is modern, and that you as a student have all the resources you need pre-course, during course, and post-course mm -hmm. so that you are achieving your learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just one example. Um, intro to Rock, compounded by Learn to Lead, mm -hmm. uh, avalanche education, skiing, uh, mountaineering, ice climbing, uh, all education products. That's, that's where I'm accountable. I see, I see. Okay. And I think um, it's really interesting that you have this role as um, a director in education, but you're also still in the field and like working one on one as well. So, can you um, share with us how your role in the field integrates with the role as like director and manager in education? Where I feel like you had to take a step back um, from <laughs> the field as well. Um, no, that's uh, that definitely deserves some explanation. So, um, my primary capacity is an administrator. Okay. Um, but I am also a credentialed uh, guide. Um, I'm an AMGA certified rock guide. Mm -hmm. I'm an AMGA certified alpine guide. And I'm a licensed provider of uh, professional certification and training at the single pitch and climbing wall level. Uh -huh. So uh, what that means is that I'm primarily administrating the education program. Yeah. But I'm also called into the field like any other guide would be mm -hmm. to teach a class or to guide a particular objective. And that's important to me because my uh, technical skills and my climbing ability need to stay current. Yeah. Um, um, this work can't be purely theoretical. There's, uh, mm -hmm. there's definitely a, a hands-on component to climbing <laughs> that mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to actually go climbing and actually go guiding to uh, keep right. current. Um, that and I spend a lot of time in the field uh, training and professionalizing our staff. Um, mm -hmm. So spending time with our guide and instructor roster at Colorado Mountain School and just uh, reviewing their teaching, reviewing their guiding, um, and making sure that uh, we're providing the highest quality product when our clients yeah. come on board. Definitely. Um, so those are the two ways I, I go into the field. I see, I see. But you've been, so you've been in climbing for a very long time, like over 20 years, is that right? Uh, yeah, it's a interesting, my relationship to climbing and mm -hmm. my professional climbing uh, so in 1997, I worked for a summer camp and we learned rudiments of climbing okay. um, so that we could take the kids out um, yeah. at this summer camp. So we've learned how to work the ropes and we learned how to teach the kids to use their feet. Mm -hmm. um, but I did not do much climbing uh, oh, really? and, uh, after that. Uh -huh. It wasn't until 2000 when I went and lived in uh, Southern France that Southern France. Uh, I, yeah, I, 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 as part of my undergraduate education, I went and studied abroad. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really started uh, investing a lot of my personal time and energy into becoming a, a climber myself. Interesting. Um, okay. That's when I, be, I, I would say that's when I began to self-identify as a climber. <laughs> I see. <laughs> um, and so I was climbing in southern France. I was climbing in northern Spain. 
Uh-huh. Um, and when I came back from Europe, I started, you know, just climbing all over the place in the Southeast, especially in North Carolina. Um, mm. And that's when I thought, I don't know how, but I want to work in this sport somehow. Or, or yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so that's when my career path really began. Once I came back to the United States and just trying to find a way to make a living uh, as, a, as a guide and as a professional instructor. Okay. Very interesting. So you, you mentioned um, that you were in Southern France um, for your undergraduate work. So you, you um, got a degree something in something that's like completely different than climbing. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's just, uh, that's just the way that happened. Um, I didn't, I didn't plan to find the passion of my life while I was an undergraduate in rock climbing, um, but I did. So I finished my degree. Um, I taught at the secondary level for a while. Um, I did a lot of substitute teaching. I did some uh, teaching at a therapeutic boarding school. Okay. Um, but the whole time I was teaching, I was trying to uh, develop my skills as a climber and a climbing instructor and accrue as much work as I could. Um, oh. And that sort of, that one foot in the teaching world, one foot in the climbing world, kept going for quite a few years. I see. Uh, I even went to graduate school so that I could, um, so, so that I could teach at a higher level. Oh, I see. Uh, but I wasn't even out of graduate school for a year before I left teaching altogether, when it finally seemed like the guiding and climbing instruction was viable. Uh-huh. And so... I taught my last semester of uh, composition and rhetoric in 2007. Okay. And wow. in, 2000, in 2008, from uh-huh. that point forward, full-time climbing instruction guiding. Um, and that's, that was the path until, yeah. gosh, seven years ago. Seven years ago, okay. Seven years ago, I started uh, publishing. Um, so I wrote my books and mm. um, I get a small royalty from those sales of those books. Uh-huh. Yep. And I think the book writing is really what put me on the radar for administrative work. Um, I think my writing and um, okay. my writing is what drew the attention of the Alpine Club and what made me competitive for that job. Um, and yeah. yeah, and so then a transition into admin I see. Uh, instead of full-time field work. So okay. full-time administration with part-time field work is what I have been doing for the last six years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in a way, like your degree in English sort of also meshed into your current work as well, because you do, um, you also do like a lot of research and like writing, um, yeah. publish a lot of work and also teaching as well. So it seems like a very different path and like, you know, pivoted into a completely different field, but it's sort of like all fit together in a way, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I, um, I don't have any regrets about some of the detours along the way for yeah. sure. And, and it, it all, I think whatever we do, the different, uh, the different paths we took informed the, the, uh, uh, the um, destination. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but for me, uh, yeah, I, I think that studying so much literature helps me uh, be a better writer. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, you know, if I if I have to be self-critical, I would say that it'd be nice to maybe not study so much poetry, maybe study some mm-hmm. more technical writing. <laughs> I see. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's definitely feedback I get from my editors. Maybe don't oh, wax really? philos- maybe don't wax philosophical in every paragraph, mm-hmm. Ron. <laughs> <laughs> and when I lived in southern France, my roommates uh, were climbers. Um, okay. among other things that they did. But on one of those climbing outings, they invited me to come along. And I just had an awakening. Uh, yeah. The very first time I tried it, uh, I enjoyed the movement. I enjoyed the, uh, the, the excitement, the, mm-hmm. the sort of the, the elation that comes with getting high off the ground. And, yeah. and I also enjoyed how climbing just gave a lot of the touring and backpacking that I was doing Mm. Uh, it gave it a point like there was a destination to these long hikes like you you would hike a long ways and then mm-hmm. go climbing mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh that was what that's what started everything 
but then once I began climbing more and more, I saw like the broad uh, number of opportunities, like the, the mountain ranges all over the world, the different mm -hmm. disciplines of climbing, uh, the seasonality of climbing, rock climbing in the summer, then mm -hmm. uh, skiing and ice climbing in the winter. And, mm -hmm. um, and so now I just, yeah, just joy. I enjoy, I climb all year in Colorado. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Colorado's great for that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. The very first challenge was just trying to uh, trying to get started, trying to have a viable uh, in income. Yeah. Um, that's why for those first years, I was one foot in academics, one foot in mm -hmm. guiding. Mm -hmm. um, and I really needed to accrue enough skills so that I could teach all year mm -hmm. and enough clients so that there were enough people calling me back and um, so that I had work every week. Yeah. And it took quite a few years to get there. Um, and then, like I said, in 2008 was the first time when I saw the first, the first time I did the budget for the year when it's like, I think this will work. I don't yeah. think I need, I don't need to take a contract with Appalachian State. I can just dive in. Mm -hmm. wow. And that was, a, that was a scary moment for our family. Our, yeah. my, my oldest son was young and my wife was starting a new job and uh, and it's a bit outrageous to say, yeah, you're going to teach, you're going to guide full time. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it was a leap of faith that paid off. And, uh, mm -hmm. but that was, that was probably the hardest thing, just getting to a point where we were making enough money mm -hmm. that it was a reality and not just a, not just a guy living in his van. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of like the actual steps you took, I know like you slowly transition, um, but what, did you like have a mentor or any, or did you figure out this whole process by yourself? Uh, no, I would really credit my relationship with the American Mountain Guides Association with uh, mm -hmm. so much of my matriculation towards uh, being a skilled guide. Mm -hmm. So that started off at an introductory level when I uh, was first mentored by Adam Fox and Jim Taylor. <laughs> um, and Adam, uh, Adam gave me my first job. He was running a climbing school in North Carolina. Um, mm. And I uh, eventually began pursuing the rock guide level training. So mm -hmm. guiding people on long rock climbs, mm -hmm. uh, then ice climbing, um, then alpine climbing. Uh, and so I tried to do one training a mm -hmm. year, just okay. as I would just budget time and money for professional development every year. So when did that start? 2003 until 2019. You can imagine I've done some kind of training wow. with the American Mountain Guides Association every year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. And uh, yeah, and I'm not finished. Uh, I've never been a very accomplished skier. Um, and I've never guided people on skis. Okay. Uh, but that's, a, that's the next horizon. It's just work on my skiing and, uh, and start developing my skills as a ski guide. So that's it's really the American Mountain Guides Association and the mentors I met through that organization. Now, and I serve on the board of directors for the AMGA. I'm an elected director. So I try to pass on that mentorship to uh, the next mm -hmm. generation as well. I see. Well, in terms of mentorship and, you know, just looking back as well, I mean, you really transitioned to something that you're really passionate about um, and a pretty big pivot. But so looking back, if you were to give a piece of advice to yourself or like somebody who wants to change career paths completely and do something that they're passionate about, um, what would be like one piece of advice that you would tell them? I would, I would tell myself to diversify sooner. <laughs> The first one um, sooner? Yeah, so early in my career, I really f s sort of fancied myself as a rock climbing specialist. Okay. And the challenge with that, in, no matter where you are in the world, is that you run out of season, right? That's true, yeah. Yeah, so you're, and that means your income dries up. Mm -hmm. So instead of spending so much time investing in that one discipline, I would have told myself to diversify sooner, to start taking more trips to Europe, uh, to South America, to the Himalayas, and taking more trips to the Northwest, just diversify sooner. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I was probably 
30, I bet I was 30 years old before I started taking annual trips to places outside the Southeast. Okay. Um, which is, which is just, just, just limiting. Yeah, <laughs> that, <laughs> um, that's true. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so I would diversify sooner. I think the, the shift to online learning has really opened up a lot of uh, new opportunities uh, mm -hmm. in our business. And it's also made me realize that, uh, that there's new proficiencies for me to gain um, mm -hmm. in video production, in bringing together online learning modules. And mm -hmm. So uh, most of my work has been focused on a traditional outdoor education, experiential education model. Mm -hmm. So virtual learning means there's a lot more for me to learn. <laughs> So yeah. I'm looking. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, yeah, and yeah, and and the and my skiing. That's probably the skiing. biggest the biggest areas that I'm looking forward to growing into. Yeah, I mean, yeah, virtual training, like it's so different than having like a face to face first, you know, and then teaching a group right in front of you versus, you know, maybe talking in front of the camera and yeah. then trying to explain everything as yeah. well yeah so you, uh, what are some things that like you thought about or like what are some of the things you have really done to accommodate i guess that transition uh well i i've done tons of auditing so i've audited yeah. so many different uh online climbing products and uh um different outdoor education products that have shifted to online mm -hmm. and i guess one of the opportunities i see is that even though you can watch a video and you can read an article and you can take a quiz, I think there's opportunities for a creative educator to make the experience more, even more interactive. Mm -hmm. um, but this is where I run into the deficit in my own skills. So I can't, I can't program a game or, um, or some kind of interactive mapping activity or something like that. So I have to learn how to do that. I can dream it up. On a, uh -huh. on a whiteboard, but yeah. I can't actually create it. Uh -huh. uh, so that's, that's where I see opportunities for myself to develop new skills. Um, okay. And I see opportunities within the uh, industry to diversify the products that are out there. If we look at, um, mm -hmm. if we look at academia, if we look at what's happening in higher ed, they're already there. They're innovating ways to make the education more interactive. And I think there's good role models for us there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so just wrapping up the interview here, um, but yeah, this was this has been really phenomenal, and it's been really interesting to learn about how you transitioned to your current passion and career path. Um, so just wanted to say thank you, thank you so much, Ron, for your time today. Um, and so I have one more question for you. So if you were to choose um, one person who you think has the in most interesting career path, um, who would you choose? Uh, I, I have had a long relationship with uh, a mentor of mine, uh -huh. and he tells an inspiring story about a high school guidance counselor um, telling him that there's no way to pursue the dream he wants to pursue, uh, really being discouraging. <laughs> he he pursued that dream despite the discouragement and um, by by all accounts achieved it and yet his career is now on the other side of the world in a completely uh -huh. different sector okay and he's enjoying more prosperity now than he ever has in his life um, and yeah he's he he's the guy I would recommend yeah okay <laughs> looking forward to talking talking with him as well.